Good morning, everyone. We're excited to get started with day two of our workshop, and thank you all for being here. I think um, I can speak on behalf of the planning committee that we were very pleased with day one and learned a lot. So thank you all very much for your presentations and your engaged discussion. Um, we're hoping we can keep everything rolling for day two. I just have a few updates on the schedule. We thought we might begin the day as planned. Um, you'll see on your agendas that we'll have a quick recap from Vencat to kick off the day, and then we'll go into our panel three discussion at 9.15. Um, it's possible we may end our panel three a little bit early and then go into our breakout session three, and we'll go ahead and shorten the breakout sessions just a little bit. Um, I think we probably don't need as much time as we had allotted yesterday. So we'll have about an hour for breakout session three. Then we'll go into a short break um, so that you all have a chance to refresh your coffee. And then we'll do our report back uh, just before lunch at 11.45. We'll then reconvene at 12.45 and go into panel number four. Um, I think that panel number four will wrap up around 1.30 and then we'll head into our last breakout session of the day that we've shortened to about 45 minutes. Um, after that, we'll report back again and then have some closing remarks probably wrap up around three, if not a few minutes after three. So I hope that makes sense. Um, everyone is on board with that plan. I wanted to let you know we're also going to have a slight shift to the breakouts again today. Um, we'll be combining the green and the yellow groups. So if you take a look at your badge and you have a green sticker where it says 628 or a yellow sticker, both of those will be going to room 105, which is just out of here to the left and down the hallway a little. Um, so we'll have Antar, who's graciously agreed to help moderate that session, and um, we'll just combine those groups into one. The other two groups, the orange group, will continue to stay in this room, and the blue group will be in room 106, which is on this floor today, also just around the corner to the left once you exit this room. And with that, I will turn it over to Venkat. Thank you very much. So I wanted to uh, start off with a recap of day one, and this is a good uh, time for people to jump in because I have uh, taken uh, some of the points made by people both in the plenary as well as in the panel and the breakout to try to uh, summarize where we are. And uh, again, I do not want to misstate and misspeak, so this is a chance for a little bit of the discussion. So. Uh, Irrigation. The, one of the first things we started off was irrigation. And even though in the great state of Kansas, as pointed out by Jim Butler, there's a lot of data, most of the world, we do not have data. You know, uh, people water without keeping an accurate count. So what is, why is it needed? Because uh, in order to do accurate water balances, uh, irrigation and amount of data uh, is, is probably a good variable to know. Uh, rather than trying to guesswork it from indirect measurements. Second thing, human factors. There are other things, human factors. So one of them is industrial use. I mean, I do not know if industrial use, again, reports water usage to, uh, you know, uh, some precision. I mean, aggregated water is in, okay. You know, if, you, if even they tell you uh, once a year that the consumption, that's fine. But, you know, you don't want daily or hourly values. It's probably over a lot of information. And of course, you know, many of the uh, areas of the world where uh, water is used for drinking brings about a whole bunch of other things. But the real thing is that, you know, when you run models, you have to know what you put in a model. And several people alluded to hydrostratigraphy. And, you know, many models have good things. And, you know, the 
exploration industry has lots of hydrostratigraphy, or stratigraphy, not, I shouldn't say hydrostratigraphy. Uh, maybe it's time for these communities to start using that subsurface geophysics and other advanced tools to do it. Because remember, mapping hydrostratigraphy is not the same as putting it in the model, because in the model you have to put actual uh, uh, variables for hydraulic conductivity, pore distribution, uh, porosity and all these things. And that's actually another translation involving uncertainty. So speaking of uncertainty, the one of the biggest things I thought was, uh, and I got this message clearly, is mismatch of scales. So when you think about it, you're going from process to a model to observations. And again, you can do it the other way around. I could say process, observations, models, but I thought this is a uh, 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 easier way to put the model in the middle of everything. So in the process, we are all trying to uh, estimate groundwater recharge. And it's one thing which you probably don't have too many direct observations of. Again, the limited situations, and mostly in the United States, where you probably can have data, set, data to monitor the uh, monitor wells, uh, look at lysimeter data, and to see actually how infiltration is contributing to recharge and replenishment of the aquifer. Very limited cases, but you can do it. Now, models, you know, you take all this stuff and put it all into these boxes. Listen, this is all uh, from the web, so I've generously taken these pictures. It's not mine, so. And then observations, you know, most of the time, we're all used to in-situ observation, whether it's river flow, groundwater observing well, et cetera. But now, you know, we have seen this great uh, new era in satellite remote sensing in the last 20 years or so, where you have GRACE and you have INSAR. Now, again, this is the problem, is that you want to correlate the process, which happens at very small spatial scales, to observations which could happen in uh, scales of over 100,000 square kilometers, and then use indirect observations of things like subsidence, which again are complicated by lack of complete knowledge of hydrostratigraphy to figure things out. So in some sense, we are dealing with a lot of uncertainty, but also the other thing is that we have a lot of tools now, especially uh, statistical tools, as well as observational tools to reduce this uncertainty to some manner. And again, what reduction means or how much is to be achieved is, you know, a big question. And there were a whole bunch of other things which are which are very important uh, uh, in the case of models that, you know, model parameters and, I, you know, uh, a parameter could be the value of your saturated hydraulic conductivity. Uh, how do you define saturated hydraulic conductivity for a clay loam versus loamy clay? I mean, there are two actual categories of soil. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's not that straightforward. Uh, and then integration of observation. Many people made this point, and, and I'm going beyond just integration between, uh, 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 you know, uh, or, or downscaling of satellite data, but integration of models, observations, and then finally analysis. You know, you want to come up with analysis because in the end of the day, science aside, this also has a valuable societal component as actually Tony showed in a couple of his slides. So, oops, what did I do? Okay, okay, so, and the last uh, slide was other issues, uh, quality of data and access to data, because, you know, when we are talking about NGE and we're talking about other countries of the world, as Tony pointed out, uh, we do not have access to uh, in-situ data in some of these countries, and, and one of the uh, um, requests made when uh, one of the questions was NGA resources, is like, can NGA facilitate this access? And again, I, I'm sure it'll depend on a case-by-case -case basis, but certainly any investigation in a different country other than the United States will benefit vastly from access to their in-situ data. Uh, second is water quality data. One of the things which was uh, said, that, you know, most of the talk has focused on water quantity, and water quality data is hard to come by come by and, you know, it's hard to, uh, you know, obtain uh, except in small select situation. And again, water quality data is a small select thing. It's not going to be at, you know, a grayscale. I mean, you're talking about water quality in an aquifer. It's probably one point which is sampled over a couple of years. And then common global database, as pointed out by some of the keynote speakers, I mean, even groundwater data, there's only eight countries which put their data into this big database. So uh, can 
something be done to facilitate this? And this is not just uh, NGA, but you know, USGS, USDA, NASA, NOAA. You know, is there some way to get this awareness out there to say, hey, look, we want to understand global water resources, especially groundwater, so what do we do? And then uh, access to high performance computing, even though some of them have become less of an issue today, but uh, people were very insistent that, you know, having access to high performance computers could help it, especially in the era of trying to get high resolution, spatial resolution. And obviously, uh, international collaborations are important, uh, and, you know, we want uh, uh, to figure out how to leverage it so that we can get more and more uh, uh, access and uh, places where we can try out our scientific hypothesis and solve scientific and societal problems. So I'll end with that, but I really want to hear from the people in the room to see if I missed something or to add something um, or comments, concerns. Come on, don't be shy. Yes, Kamini. Lean way in here. Um, okay, so I, I think the only thing that struck me that might be missing, oh, sorry, I'm comedy saying a school of minds, um, that we talked a, a lot about yesterday and like little bits and pieces was the human piece. Yes. Um, and so that might be the only thing that wasn't captured there in my mind was that, that, that idea that it's just hard to get data on what people do within mm -hmm. these systems and models. But um, that's the only thing I see that, that we talked a bit about yesterday that didn't show up here. Okay. Sankar. Other piece I just would like to highlight is uh, one is looking at the budget issues, the other aspect is looking at the extremes mm -hmm. and uh, how, because during extremes it's only the surplus or deficit of the, one of the variables, so it's important to have some attention to that and its relevance to even perhaps remote sensing, it may be very helpful there too. So a quantification of hydrological extremes. Yeah, but with respect to groundwater, yeah, good point. 